Oh, I got to make you co-host, don't I? Yeah. There we say, go. There off we to go. a bad start already. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we figured we figured it out. So there we go. Was, yep. It was when you don't Not figure out yet. the problem. All right. Let's see. All right. You got it. Uh, perfect presentation mode. Well, everyone, welcome. Uh, my name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I run the Forest Connect program, which includes the monthly webinar series. And we have a uh, repeat presenter, Kevin Dodds. Kevin's been uh, presenter with webinars before. And so if you go to the Forest Connect YouTube channel, you can do a search for Kevin and, and see some of his previous presentations. They're always fascinating um, and, and very practical, like how do you make good use of research? And that's exactly why I think people enjoy these webinars. Kevin and I go back many, many years. Kevin was an uh, undergraduate at Frostburg State University in Western Maryland and where I was, that was my first official paid job. Uh, and Kevin and I worked on a project. Well, Kevin worked on it and I got credit for it. And Kevin's gone on to do some really great things. I'm gonna, I'll let him give you the details of what he's been doing since then. And then he's going to be uh, sharing with us some of the work that he has done with Lymantria Dispar Dispar, which until recently was commonly known as gypsy moth. All right, Kevin, thank you. It's all yours. Awesome, thanks Pete. And thanks for um, inviting me back. Uh, just a really quick question, if I get, can you see my mouse moving? I wanna be able to point at things. Yes, and, yep, we okay, can see the cool. mouse. All right, I never know for sure. Uh, yep. So hi everybody. Um, so my background, uh, I've been in the area or in the region out of the Durham field office as a forest entomologist. Um, since 2005. It's kind of amazing to, to think that it's been that long uh, that I've been here because it's gone pretty fast. And um, my background is really primarily bark beetle um, ecology and management, as well as wood borers. Um, I didn't have much experience with defoliators until um, I took this job um, in New Hampshire. And so I'd worked on bark beetles in, in the southeastern U.S. and, and western um, the western U.S. and then also uh, in northern Minnesota before arriving here, I saw that this position would involve a lot of defoliator work, but the, the truth of it is I really went right into um, wood borer work, which is a little bit surprising. It was, um, it was an easier transition, I think, but here and there, uh, defoliator issues would pop up and, and we would address those or try to address them anyways. And, um, and so, what I thought I'd do today is talk a little bit about some of the data we collected in this kind of last outbreak of Lamantria dispar that occurred in southern New England, but I'll also um, touch on a few other defoliators that have been problematic in the last uh, decade, a little bit more than that too. Um, so let's see. All right, for some reason I wasn't able to forward on my keyboard, but that's all right. Uh, so just to get some terminology out of the way here, um, you probably heard this was um, uh, pretty common in the media over the last year, the, the debate over, well, it really wasn't a debate, but the replacement of the, um, the name Gypsy Moth. And, and so I'm gonna do my best to, to not use Gypsy Moth. I'll be um, trying to refer to um, the insect as Lamantria dispar. Um, LDD or LDIS bar, um, but I do apologize if I fall back at times into um, gypsy moth because it is something that I've used for um, uh, decades. Um, the new moth, the new name is common name is spongy moth. I will not be using that. I, I'm, I'm just kind of in a place where I don't really see the need to add another name into the equation as we move forward with the insect. So, um, but, but just so you know, when you're out there looking for information or you see things on the news, if you hear spongy moth, that's the same as Lamantria dispar and the former uh, gypsy moth. So the, the Northeast has had an issue with defoliators for quite a while. Um, 
you know, it's, it's not just the foliating insects that invasive defoliating insects that have come in, it's also other wood borers and things like that too. But um, so the Northeast just is a focal area of, um, of invasion. And so Lamantria the Spar has been here since the, the mid to late 1800s. Uh, you know, it was a problem early on, uh, it got established quickly and spread. Um, and then, you know, there was periodic outbreaks. The early 80s, there was um, some real issues in, in the New England air region with, uh, with a large outbreak that was multiple years. But at that, around that same time, um, a biocontrol agent, um, Entomophaga myomaga, became established, and that really helped regulate the population moving forward. So, um, you know, pretty much all of my time in the region, I had never really had to deal with Lamantria this far, where I think, you know, the, the previous generation of forest entomologists or forest health people here and foresters had to um, deal with the insect a lot more frequently. Winter moth is another invasive defoliator. It popped up in Massachusetts in um, the late 1990s. Uh, we, we worked in some outbreaks uh, in the early, well, 2010, 2012 um, timeframe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, another invasive species, uh, both, of, both winter moths and Lamantria de Soir have a pretty wide host breadth. Their um, oaks are, are one of the species that are one of the groups of trees that they, um, uh, they attack. And with winter moths, there's also a biocontrol agent that um, Joe Elkinson's lab at UMass has worked with state cooperators in Massachusetts and in Maine to, uh, to release this uh, parasitic fly that, that looks like it's at least taken hold and, and hopefully will help regulate those populations as well. Uh, brown tail moth, this is something that, you know, it's an insect that has been in the area for uh, again, since really the late 1800s, it was introduced into New England. Um, it, it, pretty, it expanded pretty rapidly um, throughout New England down into Long Island. But, but for something happened in, in terms of some, some, probably a biocontrol agent knocked back the population to where you had just a, a small population on Cape Cod and then um, a really small limited population on, in coastal Maine. But um, that's been changing, uh, it's been expanding. And the, the really the big problem with brown tail moth, we don't really know about the forest impacts yet, but, but there is this public health angle to it where the, the larval hairs are really irritating to some people. Uh, they cause skin rashes and it can be uh, more of an issue with, with people who are sensitive to that. So if you're in our area, New Hampshire, Maine, uh, Vermont, you've probably been hearing a lot about it. And I think our um, colleagues in with State Forest Health in Maine have been spending a lot of time um, trying to get that um, under control and working with um, the public to, to limit um, interactions. And then the last insect that I thought I'd mention, uh, you know, because I think probably a lot of you have run into it, especially if you're sugar bush operators, there's always this kind of debate on, um, at least for us on federal land, of, you know, do we shut down um, um, leases when we have high defoliation from forest tent caterpillar. And we've had some multiple year um, defoliation events from forest tent caterpillar, but this is a native insect. I'm not gonna talk about that anymore, but I, I just wanted to mention it because I thought um, it's probably something that uh, people had run into uh, in the past. So a key thing moving forward is in this talk um, is defoliation does not equal tree mortality, right? So you can you can have um, you know a tree completely defoliated, 100% removal of leaves, and really as long as that's in a normal growing year, you probably aren't gonna. There's probably not going to be any overly negative effect to that tree, and the tree will be able to rebound and uh, be be pretty healthy the next year. Uh, the real issue, of course, becomes when you have defoliation coupled with uh, multiple years of defoliation, then you really do start to see that tree mortality occur in stands or in urban areas. And this is just a shot from Rhode Island. I think this was 2016, but um, it gives you an idea of the scale of some of these defoliation events that we hadn't really seen in a while. And, and so uh, this is Lamantria de Spar um, just hammering for us. And you know you can imagine obviously this is a mosaic of of stress on that landscape. And so within this, even with just one year of defoliation, you know you may get um, a little bit of mortality throughout that area based on site factors or other disturbances or things like that. But generally speaking, you know this area with just one year of defoliation, it'll either refoliate later in the, the summer 
or you know kind of take the summer off and refoliate that follow you know leaf out that following year um, and get kind of back to normal um, but the real issue becomes you know when when defoliation is kind of compounded by other factors and then you can really start to, to lose some trees and and so some things that are really bad news for trees um, that first one, the successive waves of defoliators, it's not really talked a lot about a lot, but I think, you know, moving forward, it could be an issue. And, and what I mean by that is you could have a situation where, let's say, winter moth, that's a very early season defoliator, hits trees, um, you know, even before they leaf out, feeds, uh, moves on in development. The trees are then, you know, continue to leaf out. They have damaged leaves to some degree, and you could have forest tent caterpillar or Lamantri Dispar then, then hit those trees as well and, and either feed on the damaged leaves from winter moth or the refoliated leaves that um, are a result of feeding by winter moth. So I think it would be something interesting for somebody to look into down the line. And I do worry that you know we're gonna be putting these um, multiple events within a year and then that would change um, the scenario for trees, I think too. <clears throat> I mentioned, you know, the duration and certainly multiple years of defoliation is problematic, even in, in relatively healthy stands for healthy trees. Um, so that one year, you, you may get a little bit of mortality and really stress trees. That second year, um, you start to see more uh, mortality. And then if you go into a third year, that's where it really compounds and you get a lot more uh, tree mortality in a lot of situations. Of course, the intensity on an individual tree matters, you know, are we talking about a hundred percent defoliation of the canopy or 50 or 40 percent uh, and that will you know that will result in different levels of stress in that tree drought and disturbance does both go kind of hand in hand but you know any um, drought certainly stresses trees their host defenses are become compromised over time and so you can open up some avenues for secondary insects and pathogens and then this is the same for anthropogenic disturbance, like a stand entry for thinning. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to do that during a high year of defoliation or maybe even the year after. And so those, those sort of localized disturbances can also cause problems for trees that then are defoliated or were defoliated the year before the disturbance. Um, and, you know, it's really the secondary insects and pathogens that often just kick the trees over, you know, so those, those come into, uh, at least in terms of the insects, they come in, they, they are attracted to stressed trees, uh, get in them. And then in, in, in this situation with that insect shown there, the two-line chestnut borer um, and oak trees, it's, it's primarily the reason the trees die. But pathogens like armillaria get a, get a foothold too, and, and they can um, certainly help kill the trees too. So I'm just going to run through some information on um, winter moth and brown tail moth before moving into um, a little bit more detail about some of the work we did with Lamantria dispar. Um, as I mentioned, you know, winter moth was really kind of a problem in, in southern New England first. Really, we worked um, in Massachusetts only, but Connecticut and Rhode Island also had some issues. But you can see, I think, you know, defoliation was recorded earlier than um, 2000, but it was thought to be um, a native species until further investigation revealed that it was the invasive um, winter moth. And so, you know, we had some multiple year events of defoliation in 2010, 2011. Uh, we worked in some of these sites, Mike Simmons did a master's degree at UNH on that. And, and there was, you know, tree mortality, oak overstory, overstory mortality um, in these stands caused by that, you know, that there's, there's two years of defoliation, um, repeated defoliation in, in those stands. Uh, things kind of died down by 2015, uh, at least in Southern New England. But of course, when things get better somewhere, they get worse other places. And so we saw um, an increase in activity um, in Maine. And so uh, in both these areas, the, the fly, the biocontrol agent, Byzenius has been introduced. Um, hopefully, it seems to me that it would be too early to see any real effect of that yet, but, but maybe we are, and, um, and we just haven't seen too much activity of winter moths um, in the last couple of years. I do worry a little bit that, that maybe it's out there doing a little bit more damage, but it's getting um, masked by all of the Lamantri dispar um, defoliation. 
Uh, brown tail moth, again, that's the insect with that sort of public health angle to it. <clears throat> and it had really restricted its population to two areas. And you can see just the, the acreage defoliated by year here. Uh, not a lot going on, uh, you know, for the last um, decade or more. Um, and this goes back, I think really the, there was the, the population started receding, I think in the, in the 40s or the 50s, um, maybe a little bit later than that. Uh, but, but recent history, not a lot of activity, uh, but then something started changing in 2015 and we've seen kind of a continual, almost continual um, spike in populations with this little dip in 2019. <clears throat> and then certainly 2020 and 2021, or tw yeah, 21 were um, significant years for defoliation. And uh, like I said, a, a, a problem that I think has taken a lot of time for our partners to, um, to try to confront and work with, you know, um, the general public and just trying to manage the insects. <laughs> so when we look at this on the landscape, um, I hope you can see these all right. The, there's, so 2014, so these are um, polygons from area, annual aerial detection surveys that the state of Maine would have flown. Um, and, and this is brown tail moth damage here in 2014. And you can kind of follow that. It expands a little bit in 2015. Uh, 2016, it, it gets a little bit worse. It's still kind of, you know, more of a coastal thing. Uh, 2017, uh, in some ways, doesn't look as bad, but you start to get um, some, some more uh, defoliation um, inland from where it had, had not or had not been seen before. Uh, let's see, 2018, kind of that pattern continues. Unfortunately, you know, you pick up some areas again where it's likely that the insects established. Um, 2019, uh, you know, not as much defoliation on the landscape, but if you look at the footprint, if you can see those little red dots, you know, we've got kind of a larger area that um, now has the moth present. And remember, these are, you know, this is, this is an area that, in, that involved towns, um, very rural communities. And so more and more people were, you know, um, having to interact with the moth and, and, and the larvae, well, really the larvae, and um, deal with the consequences of those, um, those hairs and, and having rashes and, and all of that, all of the negative health effects of that. <clears throat> 2020, we saw things expand again. Now you've got bigger polygons of defoliation, more activity further, you know, west than before. And 2021, um, that pattern continued. So now, you know, we're in a situation looking at that where you, you probably expect some, some level of tree mortality in those stands. I don't have any information on that, but I'm, I'm sure it's being assessed um, either by the state or, or some of the labs up there. But, but anyways, a, a much larger footprint now of another invasive moth um, that, that is, um, again, hit, hitting for us pretty hard. Uh, so Lamantria and the Spar, uh, you know, again, an insect that's been here a long time. Recent history hadn't really been uh, a huge problem, except for that there's sort of this notorious early 80s um, outbreak. And, and I hear that coming up all the time, just in tree ring studies, not focused on insects, but it's, there's a really good, you know, marker for that um, and the impact that it had on tree growth at the time. But um, so an insect that's been here for a long time, now kind of regulated by um, in normal years by um, I almost said the soil theory and just but um, entomophaga my myga and um, and this is just a, a map from the slow the spread program this is a national program trying to limit the spread of Lamantria to spar not stop it but but try to work on the margins of the population here with a lot of trapping to know where it's at and then um, you know, some insecticide treatments when needed. And then mate disruption to the darker greens or is just represents the area um, known to be infested by Lamantria dispar. So a lot of effort going into kind of slow the spread with the idea that you know that allows biocontrol to kick in um, and things like that to try to you know hopefully um, reduce damage when it does move into these areas where it hasn't been before. Uh, in terms of host trees, it's um, highly polyphagous. I think there's you know around 300 species of um, trees and shrubs that it'll feed on. I think of it up here um, as a you know a pest of oaks. Those are the forests that we've worked on it. 
um, on it. And, uh, but, you know, birch, poplar, uh, willow, basswood, those are all considered good hosts. There's like a, a breakout of kind of good, um, acceptable and poor hosts. And, and I think of it as, you know, the population grows, um, that, that, um, that food source or appropriate host list grows. And so you'll get them, you'll get uh, larvae feeding on, you know, those subpar hosts at that point, because there's just so many out there. And it'll feed on pine at that point too. And we actually saw it on um, pitch pine uh, this summer in Maine, which is a little surprising. <laughs> so factors that lead to tree mortality with Lamantria just are very similar to what I've already covered, but uh, drought is really important, and um, and that that came to, that that comes into play with what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but if you have really droughty conditions, and then you get defoliation on top of that, that's a lot harder for the trees to absorb, and and you'll get some tree mortality. Um, the, a dry spring is really important, not not necessarily directly related to tree health in this situation, but if it's really dry out, the that that fungus Entomophaga myga does not spread um, readily through the population of developing larvae. So you lose that control um, or those limits on the population and it's kind of released from that uh, and that can be um, a problem. And then um, repeated defoliation. So, you know, we've always had these kind of single years of, um, of, of Lamantri this far defoliation. Um, but when you get, you know, a year or two in, in, um, in order, or maybe even a third year consecutive years, then you can really start to see some tree mortality. And then at the same time, when these trees are stressed and more and more of them are stressed and dying, um, you can get a numerical response from two line chestnut borer. And so you get an increasing wood borer population out there that's, you know, slightly more aggressive than a lot of wood borers, just looking for those stressed um, and these can be, you know, overstory trees, pretty large trees um, that are sitting there, you know, waiting to be attacked by um, two line chestnut boar. Two line chestnut boars are very good at exploiting those, and that's ultimately the the mechanism of why the tree dies. And you can see this is from um, northern northern Minnesota. Uh, this was a salvage log um, red oak that came out of one of the forests there when I was working. And when you would pop this bark off, the uh, two line chestnut Borer larvae would just spill out. I'd never seen um, a density of wood borers like that before, and and it, that was like the third year of of issues up there. And so there was just a huge population around. And so you can imagine, um, you know, these all all of these galleries that girdles the tree pretty quickly and just will will um, kick it over into dying. So looking at uh, recent defoliation, um, Southern New England, you can kind of see that, you know, we'd have these little bumps in the road. I started in 2005 and, and just again, never really, I'd hear about defoliation in New York, mostly here and there. Um, it would pop up a little bit in, in Southern New England, but nothing major uh, until this sort of 2015, 2016 event that was, you know, several years of, of heavy defoliation um, across Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Um, it seems like to me the heaviest um, hit areas were uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island, and I'll, I'll show some of our SCAN um, assessment data in a second. <clears throat> and it's um, kind of the same thing as we showed for winter months. You know, things get a little bit better in, in southern New England, they get worse in northern New England. And, um, and so this past year, we saw the defoliation, heavy defoliation. I was working in northern New Hampshire. There was a lot of defoliation there. Um, Vermont had a lot of defoliation, uh, and then Maine did as well. And, and as I mentioned, that you know, I, I work on southern pine beetle, and we were looking at um, some pitch pine stands in Waterboro, and and the oak were hit, you know, hard by um, the mantra just far, but it had also moved in at least along this one edge into some of the pitch pine, and so that was interesting to see. Um, so, you know, I, I, we don't know what 2022 will be, you know, hopefully we'll have a wet spring and um, Entomophaga can get a hold in the population and knock things back, but, you know, I, I expect we'll see some level of defoliation in those states as, as well. And the same for New York. New York is following kind of a similar pattern to those um, to the northern New England states. And you can see, again, like a little bit more activity, uh, you know, through the years um, with the mantra just far, and then this spike in 2021 um, for some reason. So just to show
show this on the map uh, starting in 2014. Uh, not much activity, a little bit of defoliation was mapped down here um, in Connecticut. 2015, you see, you know, all of a sudden we've got a lot more activity, some in, in um, New York, but Connecticut, Rhode Island, um, and then Massachusetts, parts of Massachusetts um, showing, you know, signs of defoliation. And this, this is mapped from the air, so it could be severe defoliation or, or just enough to catch the aerial surveyor's attention and, and not be that severe. Um, it's not really broken out this way anyways. Um, 2016, that pattern continues and, and you see kinetic parts of Connecticut and parts of Rhode Island getting hammered. Um, it continues in 2017, <clears throat> you know, this looks pretty bad. Um, I'll say right now, the, the plots that I'll be talking about uh, were, were down in here. Um, so we had sites in Connecticut and Rhode Island that were right through some of the heaviest hit areas. Our plots in Massachusetts were up here in areas that weren't hit as hard. Um, 2018, things you know seemed to be dying down a little bit, um, getting a little bit of relief. We were out surveying in 2019 and, and saw really you know like remnant default remnant Lamandry this far populations out there, um, and then in some areas they were just the larvae were there, but they were hammered by um, the fungus, and so they were all dying at the base of trees. <laughs> So 2020, um, things look pretty good in southern New England. Some of this, you know, might be an artifact of, I, I can't remember um, if everybody, if all the states in southern New England were able to fly. I think they were um, to some degree because of COVID, but that could also limit the mapping. Uh, but you start to see some activity in New York, uh, western New York. And then in 2021, this is what we were dealing with from last year. You know, you've got Maine. Uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, upstate New York, and western New York with a lot of activity. So hopefully things change um, over the spring and early summer and we see uh, heavy mortality to larvae so that we don't get a lot of second year excessive um, feeding by the lar those larvae. And if you put it all together, the eight years, uh, this shows the, the area impacted by uh, one species of defoliator, you know, over that period. And I like to do this just to sort of see, you know, get a sense of how much area is affected. Of course, remember within this area, probably, you know, 99% of that area is not suffering high levels of tree mortality, but there are some impacts occurring. So to move into uh, our assessment data, this is work that I did with Isabel Monk. She's our uh, one of our pathologists out of Durham. And then John Janelle, who's really with Northern Research Station, uh, but he was on detail with us. So uh, he helped out a lot on this project as well. And kind of our goal, you know, we were seeing a lot of, there was obviously a lot of media attention, you know, about, um, you know, at this point, trees, this is 2019, trees were dying. Uh, the public was getting concerned. You know, New England forests devastated by invasive caterpillars. Um, millions of Connecticut trees are dying. What's killing them? These are just some of the articles. And so, you know, we're in kind of a unique situation with state and private that um, it's easy for us to work across state. So um, we thought maybe we could help out our partners with generating some data that could be useful down the road for them. Um, and so while they were having to confront, you know, management of the insect directly at these times, we could go in and, and collect some data that hopefully would be useful in the future. Um, so it, as you can imagine, you know, you do a project like this across state boundaries, it really does involve a lot of people and it doesn't, doesn't move forward without a lot of help. And, and certainly, you know, Dan, Vicki, Nicole, all the guys in Rhode Island helped us find sites, helped us get access to sites. Uh, and so we, we wouldn't be able to move forward without all of their help. Uh, Tom and Rebecca in our GIS shop were critical to, Tom helped us pull all of this different data together. Um, Rebecca helped us get going with survey one, two, three. And then Valerie was really generous with her, you know, she has this, um, uh, vegetation change remote sensing data set from a couple years um, over the area and she was really generous in sharing that with us so, and we tried to incorporate that into <clears throat> to site selection and then uh, Charles and Liz were are with FIA and, and you know we were looking to be in 
um, oak dominated stands and, and they were able to pull some of that information um, to narrow the landscape for us um, to, to, to focus on some of the, the more heavily oak, um, oak dominated stands. So in terms of methods, uh, you know, this was a retrospective study and, and there are inherent limits or limitations in that. I'll, I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, so we were, you know, entering the stand, you know, or, or the stands um, a year or two after defoliation had ended. And, you know, it would have been great to be in, you know, either a permanent plot um, system or had some information of what was going on directly in the stands we were sampling during the defoliation events and and that's a that's a weakness to our study i still think you know we we got a lot of good data and information but um not knowing you know what the conditions were during defoliation limited what we can do with this <clears throat> uh, for site selection you know we focused only on state lands just because we, you know we wanted to cover a lot of area get into a lot of stand and it just would have would have been difficult for us to track down land landowners or for our state partners to do that. So we just worked with our state partners to get into um, to work on state land. And so we used um, um, aerial detection survey data, FIA data, the inventory data that's national, and then landowner landowner contacts. Those are really you know contacts with local foresters that could kind of guide us towards areas that they were concerned about that had been defoliated. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we wanted these oak dominated stands. Uh, we had originally hoped to have a range of um, Lamantria Dispar activity in the previous one, two, and maybe even three years. We thought that early on, um, but that became difficult too. And we were hoping to partition, you know, our sampling or our assessments across the foliation intensity in years defoliated. So, you know, we thought we'd be able to go into a selection of stands. Um, in southern New England that had not been defoliated, some that had been defoliated a year, some that had been two, and maybe even some that had been, you know, defoliated one year, not the second, and then hit again on the third year, but we were not able to really pull that information together. Um, so it just became more of a general assessment. Uh, we put in overstory and sapling plots. We did not do understory veg plots just because at that point we thought we were going to be moving um, pretty fast across the landscape. We were hoping for, you know, 40 or 50 sites, but we didn't end up with that many. Um, but we have good measurements on, you know, tree measurements, the uh, sapling layer, uh, living dead trees, all of that, um, associated insects and pathogens. I'm not going to touch on the pathogens today, um, but I'll hit a little bit on um, one slide on insects that have samples in there. I should say non-defoliating insects. Um, and then our plan was, you know, we sampled the latter part of the summer into September, and then we were going to um, come back to our plot in the winter to do um, a pretty detailed dendroecological study. Um, but that was COVID hit, you know, we started hearing about COVID in what, January or so. And I think by March, uh, we were locked down in terms of travel and, and that continued <clears throat> into that next summer. And to be fair too, even while we were sampling, it became clear that, you know, standing dead oak and um, well really standing dead oaks were already at a point of decay that those outer rings would have been problematic to, to um, collect and, or, and certainly to measure. So, you know, as much as I would have loved to have information on the dead oaks, the um, surviving oaks, and then the, the, the broader forest or, you know, trees that were in those plots, and their growth patterns, um, it just really, it wasn't going to happen, unfortunately. So some considerations as I, you know, we move forward and start showing these data. Um, I already mentioned, we, we really didn't have information on defoliation intensity. Um, and, you know, that's the ideal situation. You get that from permanent plots that are, you know, monitored pretty frequently. So we couldn't say, you know, um, tree number, oak number, red oak number five, had been defoliated 40% or anything like that. We were going into just stands that we knew had been defoliated over the last couple of years. We had uh, limited data on the spatial extent of defoliation within a stand. You know, so we were going into a stand just assuming the whole stand had been defoliated, and um, that's not always the case. I think for where we worked and and the the, the 
the contacts we had, we were able to pretty much pretty well, like, you know, decipher areas that we should pull. Um, and salvage logging was ongoing. And, and you know, this will become, I'll talk about this a little bit more when we look at the Connecticut data and the Rhode Island data. Um, but, you know, we were out there and Connecticut had already um, been able to salvage some areas to get some, you know, return on those forests. Um, and so, and then, Rhode Island was also doing the same thing. So we lost some sites because of that, um, but for a good reason. Um, and then we just, the I think the probably the more severe um, impact that stands in Connecticut were already salvaged by the time we were um, started working in here. And as I think I already mentioned, you know, we entered the stands a year after most defoliation occurred. Um, and then another key thing is mortality, I think was certainly ongoing in these stands, you know, so some of the living, oak that you know we we marked as live oak um were probably dead a year or two after we were there and, and this is an example of one of those from uh rhode island and you can see the part of the crown but the whole crown was dead but we had these lower branches and that's just not a tree that's probably going to go much further than a year so uh, mortality to, to some of the oak may have been higher than than what we reported in some of these stands too at least in connecticut and uh, rhode island and as you probably are aware, you know, the, the region was in a drought. Um, I think what's interesting, this is Palmer drought severity by year. Um, Connecticut and Massachusetts were between moderate and severe drought. Rhode Island really, uh, you know, and this is a region wide assessment or estimate, uh, really didn't suffer as bad as, as the, the conditions that were in Connecticut and Massachusetts, according to PDSI. Um, of course, that varies across, you know, at, at the site level. And this is kind of the lay, or this is the layout of our of our um, sampling sites with multiple plots at each location, of course. But um, if you remember that heavily defoliated um, area of Connecticut and Rhode Island that was hit for multiple years, this is you know where our plots ended up. Um, Patch hog mostly, um, and Natch hog in Connecticut, and various sites in in Rhode Island, and you know Massachusetts. It just kind of fell out by state that you know Massachusetts. Um, ended up with the areas that had the least impact um, and were the least foliated, at least at this point. And so these sites didn't, sorry, I'm losing my mouth. Um, these sites up here were not uh, heavily defoliated, um, even over that multiple years. They were touched, but, but there wasn't heavy defoliation recorded there. And so, you know, when you're going in retrospectively, it, you have to do some detective type work, which is um, interesting. and. Uh, interesting to do and to piece together. And so, you know, we were looking at dead trees, um, relating that to the, you know, the high likelihood that um, Lamantry to spar defoliation is what kicked those trees over. Um, so we were trying to age the, 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 the tree death, the time of death. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's easy, it's easier to do on pine trees, I'll say that, but um, the way that some of these oaks were dying, you know, made it really difficult. So you'd have some of the larger crowns go one year, the top might be dead, um, but you still had branches at the bottom. So these things that, these characteristics that you used to age, like presence of fine twigs, the level of, you know, the size of the branches that are left in the crown, the tightness of the bark, things like that, they didn't really tell a, um, a cohesive story necessarily. So. Um, you know, like I was really comfortable with, you know, did the tree die this year or last year? And then um, did the tree die two or three years ago? But when you get beyond that to break it out any finer is super dicey. And so we didn't, we just stopped that kind of four plus years. Uh, and, and, you know, that I'm comfortable with, you know, the tree is starting to show um, a lot of signs of decay, bark sloughing off and things like that. So why this is important is, um, you know, you can see in Massachusetts, so this graph, these are just our sites down here, the um, vertical bars break up the, the state. This will be the setup for a couple figures. Uh, and then the percentage of dead oaks um, is on the, on the Y. And so you can see in Massachusetts, the majority of the tree mortality that we were reporting was, you know, four plus years old. Um, some of that was much older too. And so a lot of the mortality that we recorded would have predated the, you know, the, the defoliation that did occur in the area um, from Lamantry to Spar. That story, you know, starts to shift in Connecticut and Rhode Island where we have um, 
still have some older mortality in these stands, of course, because um, that there's just a normal background tree mortality. But we're starting to see, you know, more and more um, uh, tree mortality that kind of fits within the frame of, you know, just uh, Lamantria disbar defoliation. And, uh, and even, you know, we were there a year, two years out from defoliation, and you can see the dark blue bars, you know, we're still getting new, um, new mortality. And as I said, like, I think that that was going to continue in some of these stands, especially in Connecticut, where um, we had more residual um, oak remaining than what we had in Rhode Island, where those trees were probably going to die. Another, you know, another cohort of those trees would die over the next um, year or two. So um, same kind of setup for this graph. This is percent uh, basal area loss. I just used this because we were comparing so many um, different sites. And uh, you know, this is where again it gets a little bit misleading. In Massachusetts, it's two to twenty-five percent basal area loss of oak. Um, again, a lot of that was older, so you know, I think we, we'd easily cut that range into probably two to ten percent of anything recent. Which and some of that could just be background again. So not a lot of a lot of loss in um, in Massachusetts. You move into Connecticut and Rhode Island. You know, Connecticut upwards of sixty, you know, sixty percent. Um, loss of oak basal area in these stands. And then in Rhode Island, which again, Rhode Island, we only had three stands because of um, pretty um, fast paced salvage operations. Uh, you had, you know, upwards of 100% loss of oak in these stands. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to keep this in context. You know, these are a few stands on the landscape that were known, you know, heavily hit by um, Lamantry to Spar. But on the other hand, you know, it's a it's a true story of what can happen in a stand. So in a way, it's the worst case scenario for these stands where you have um, drought compounded with you know multiple years of defoliation, and certainly you know site variability um, plays into this too. The lower graph is you know is just a percent stems loss. I'm not going to spend time going through that. Um, the pattern is. Um, you know, of course, very similar to basal area loss, but I did want to include that. Um, I, you know, I think about importance value a lot um, when I do this type of work, and and for me, that the uh, average of um, relative basal area and relative stem density, and uh, it allows for me, anyways, to think about um, a little bit about structure and composition change, and. So for this figure, importance values on the Y, and then the black bar is oak importance value before the defoliation events happen, and then oak importance value after. So after defoliation went through, so we removed the mortality. Um, and so, you know, again, right, no surprise, not a lot of activity or changes, as I should say, in Massachusetts. Um, in Connecticut, you start to see, you know, oak losing its importance. In, in those stands, but still relatively important um, contributor. In Rhode Island, totally eliminated oak in two stands. Um, there's a little bit left in Hillsdale, but I, again, those were trees that were in really, really poor condition uh, and probably died later that year or the next year. Um, and so, you know, more significant changes to that forest community and that so the overstory forest uh, community in Rhode Island. Um, and a lot of changes in Connecticut as well, but not as severe. Uh, so all of these are from uh, Massachusetts sites and it just shows, again, it's important value, but it also uh, brought in the most common tree species. So it'll give you an idea of, of what, what changes are occurring in those forests. Nothing really of note you know, to, to, to point out for Massachusetts. Um, when you get into, um, Connecticut, you know, we started to see, uh, you know, pitch pine in one instance. This was a really interesting forest. I was surprised to run into pitch pine in there. Uh, but you see pitch pine in that instance becoming more and more important species with the oaks diminishing. Uh, and kind of the common situation was, you know, of course, um, <laughs> red maple um, doing better and uh, birch um, becoming more important species, more dominant species in, in the stands that are left or the forests that are left in these areas.
Uh, as you can imagine, for what you've seen already, you know, Rhode Island looks, um, took a harder hit and there's more changes where oak has been eliminated. You see, you know, um, birch and red maple being the overstory canopy there. Um, and that's the forest that's really um, going to be present on those sites for quite a while uh, because oak is pretty much eliminated from those sites. And we didn't really see um, any regen, well, any saplings to speak of. I think we, we count it uh, maybe like three <laughs> oak saplings uh, across all of the, that area that we sampled. Uh, so if you look at the, these are um, size class distributions and on the top is Massachusetts, uh, the middle are Connecticut sites and the bottom are Rhode Island sites. And um, these are just, you know, just for space, I just picked three from each of um, to represent Massachusetts and Connecticut, all the sites for um, Rhode Island. And um, the clear bar are the dead oaks that were present at sampling. And this is again, just to look at, you know, what trees were getting lost. Um, Massachusetts, again, that background mortality from the last, you know, um, five plus years really, uh, you know, so mortality here and there. Connecticut, um, you start to get some more mortality to oak in these larger size classes. So you're shifting that um, distribution. We didn't have a ton of, you know, Lamantria dispar commonly is associated with that, that like suppressed or um, mid canopy layer. And, and a lot of our stands didn't have a lot of trees in that um, class. It was, um, and I think that's why the overstory bear the brunt of everything. But but anyways, there you know there were some, and you see that here, and 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 we lost it, but still, kind of a, a solid size class distribution that's not changed too much um, in most situations, and that was the same for our other sites in Connecticut, uh, in Rhode Island, uh, you can see you know um, a complete elimination of larger size class trees out here, so that structure, that forest, completely different now, um, you know here just a, a pretty dramatic reduction of trees, but these are smaller trees that were um, affected here and the same goes for Raleigh. So, so a lot of like structural changes in, in these forests um, that we attribute primarily to Lymantria to Spar multi-year defoliation events. And I got to work wood borers in and uh, this is the one slide, I think this is my last data slide, uh, but this is just percent of oak with signs and we did this for insects and um, disease. Uh, but uh, I really expected to see a lot of ambrosia beetles. We have a lot of exotic ambrosia beetles. They um, dominate uh, catches in the in forest settings. But um, I was a little bit surprised. We didn't see a lot of activity with ambrosia beetles. They weren't as common as what I thought anyways. And um, you know we found a little bit more of them in, um, I think in white oak than we did red oak. But two line chestnut borer, no surprise, it's been well documented over many years. Um, its behavior related to um, Lamantria dispar defoliation or other defoliators. Um, so uh, two line chestnut borer was ubiquitous across sites, and, and it was, um, I think, you know, commonly the factor that just, you know, pushed the trees over and ultimately killed them. So the one other thing I learned during all this is it's really hard to get good pictures of uh, stand level defoliation and mortality. And so I'm going to run through a few, um, but they are not outstanding. But you can see, you know, all of these trees in this kind of background here, all of those oaks are dead. The foreground oaks are dead to um, some over here, some over here. Um, so really opening up those canopies, a lot of these stands had had some level of management over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and in some cases, you know, one stand in Rhode Island was a beautiful stand that I think had been managed for wildlife. It was really open and um, all those overstory oaks that were left were, were killed off. And here's another example, just kind of looking down this little hill, um, you know, all these in the background here are dead through here. Um, and this is the tree that, that actually was set upon that year. It was one of the only trees we saw um, the current year defoliation. Same thing, this is um, also, uh, this is on patch hog, I think. And again, in the foreground, a lot of dead trees, a lot of dead trees back here. Uh, so these are, you know, great trees, you know, um, 
mostly co-dominant. Um, the way I break out canopy layers, you know, the majority of trees are co-dominant at that level. Um, but we had a few that, that you would consider dominant trees as well, and, and they were um, killed off too. So a lot of loss of big trees with big crowns. Um, and the other thing that was an issue, and this is in Rhode Island, where you know these uh, dead trees with big broad canopies, you know, right against roads. If you know Connecticut, and Rhode Island, uh, you have a lot of rural communities and winding roads going back there. And and I think it was Tom Worsley did a like a roadside estimate and the numbers of dead trees that were you know risk, at risk of damaging infrastructure was um, staggering. You know, so these trees really need to come down before they take out the power with an ice storm or something like that, or just fall down naturally. But but really, like this road, I mean, it wasn't miles of dead trees, but there were sections of that road that were uh, was pretty frightening to see how many trees were just hanging out dead there. So uh, just to wrap this up, uh, you know, drought and greater than one year defoliation really equaled high mortality in our stands. And again, that's you know well documented. I think um, you know in our situation you know, we probably showed the worst case scenario uh, in some of those Rhode Island stands. Um, and maybe that's a little bit extreme for what you would normally see with these changing climates uh, um, and, uh, and potential for increased drought. Uh, I do think it's not something we really worked in, but, you know, site conditions are definitely an important variable in all this. And, and we had some pretty wet sites up to very dry sites. Um, in the stands we sampled, uh, stand level changes occurred in Rhode Island, um, less so in Connecticut and Massachusetts. But I do think that we saw the, we would have seen significant stand level changes too in Connecticut, but some of those sites, um, they were able to get in and, and get product out. Um, and so they were already salvaged when, when we worked in there. In Massachusetts, it really just, the areas we were in just weren't, really weren't affected. I think they were lightly defoliated a year, maybe heavily defoliated, but really for only one year. I mentioned this already, but oak saplings were very rare and it, it was like exciting when we would finally find one. Um, and I think it was a, a total of three um, oak saplings across, you know, 20 or so sites. Uh, certainly, you know, in those Rhode Island sites, maybe in some of the Connecticut sites, we'll see a compositional shift away from oak in some of those stands unless um, the management occurs in there to, to try to maintain it. And then, uh, as recorded elsewhere, you know, two line chestnut borer uh, was abundant and, and affected um, trees um, pretty dramatically too and pushing them over um, with some of the pathogens. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of people on here are, are uh, natural resource managers and there's different levels of land ownership, how much you manage, things like that, private property owners. So um, it's difficult really to say what to do with, not just with the mantry to spar, but any defoliator, because you're really trying to guess what is gonna occur the next year because there's a lot of variables that come into play. <clears throat> Generally speaking, current year defoliation does not mean much for, um, the next year uh, defoliation. So I think you know some keys are really you know monitor your property, beware of local conditions. You know if if you're concerned about populations, you can do egg mass surveys, and they are better predictors of defoliation. But there's still a lot of variables in play with that too. But that can give you a better sense um, than previous year defoliation if you have to worry about. Um, the potential for high populations again, um, and that may help you make a decision on whether you want to treat or not. And then, you know, once you think about it all, you can do nothing. And in, I think in most cases, you're probably going to be okay. But if you're in year two of defoliation and you've got, you know, um, 100 acres or whatever, and you've got high egg mass surveys, then, you know, you may want to be conservative and say, I, I don't want no matter what the conditions are, I do not want my trees to be defoliated again. And that's when you can start thinking about um, treatment with um, pesticides. In a smaller situation, a uh, smaller woodlot, or you know, if you have tr like backyard trees or whatever, uh, you can just destroy the egg masses. Um, that won't eliminate larvae because the larvae can balloon into the crowns and feed, but you'll you'll knock the population back some. That's the same for barriers and then traps that are put on the bowl where you kill the larvae. Um, and then ultimately, if you have you know trees that you're worried about, urban or forest, um, 
there's ways to treat those with there's a you know bacillus thuringiensis, a, a, a bacterial insecticide you can use, and I you know depending on states you may have some um, chemical options too. But I don't I don't work with uh, chemicals very much, and and they they all are different depending on what state you're in. So you, the best thing to do would if you're worried would be to um, reach out to your state forest health folks, and they'd be able to guide you. Um, down a sort of a, a, a decision tree on, on what you should do. So that's it. Um, I think that was a lot, <laughs> probably, but I, I hope I didn't lose everybody. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great, Kevin. Thank you. That was really interesting. I enjoyed that. So the first question that came to my mind was, um, you showed the slide of percent basal area mortality. Was there, did you see or did you look at um, whether that was related at all to canopy diversity? So, you know, where you had more or, I mean, the, the hypothesis would be with greater canopy diversity, there was, you know, a lower percentage of the oaks that died. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we didn't do any of that with this. If my, a lot of the stands were very similar. Um, uh, you know, I would think, I'm trying to think back, it was a couple of years ago that we were in there, but um, I would not, my, kind of my remembrance is that we had oak dominated that co-dominant dominant layer, you know, and then maple and birch were sitting more at that intermediate layer. We didn't, we had some maple that were co-dominant trees, but, it, but they weren't really that common. Um, so I don't think it would have, factor we i don't think we would have picked up differences in, in these stands okay all right um and then can you put up the last slide one of the participants would like to see the last slide there we go so do you want me to read through the questions are you able to see the questions what's easiest Kevin? Uh, cool if you don't mind reading them sure sure let me scroll back to the top so obviously this is the point in time when folks can add in uh, questions that they have. Uh, all right. So one person sees uh, LDD during surveys for spotted lanternfly. Um, and she reports that on IMAP invasive and in the PRISM frameworks. But are there other, so if people in general, people, are seeing Lymantria defoliation. Should they report that somewhere? I, mean, I think it depends on you know, the states, of course, but a lot of it'll be picked up by aerial surveys. Um, you know, if you're in an area where you're seeing a lot of egg masses or defoliation, it probably doesn't hurt to, to send the states, uh, you know, state forest health people um information i don't want <laughs> i hesitate to say that just to not overwhelm them uh, you know when when um things get really bad but i think i think they would in most cases most states would want to know about high concentrations if they don't already know about them okay uh, okay so with respect to egg mass parasitism and egg mass removal should egg masses that appear to be parasitized be removed during the fall and winter, or they be left, or should they be left if the parasite larvae is still in the egg mass waiting to emerge? So basically, I mean, you don't want to throw out the baby with the baby with the bathwater or whatever that says. Yeah, is. for sure. Yeah, I, I would leave them, you know, and I mean, I hesitate at times to, like, you, a lot of this stuff is so time specific and I, I haven't worked on it you know directly on a lot of this stuff but but yeah I would leave those um, until after and then then remove them early okay uh, when was the survey conducted to assess the number of years since oak mortality was that in 2020 uh, no we entered the stands in 2019. So we were, you know, a, a year in some cases, I think two years after. Okay. Um, what were the, did you see patterns between um, site conditions? I mean, what, what were the site conditions that corresponded to greater or lesser 
to uh, mortality? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And, you know, some of the, um, some of the Connecticut sites were, you know, pretty rich sites. And when we were in um, Rhode Island, for example, like Mount Tom and at least a section there that we were working in, that was a really dry site. Um, the Howley site, uh, same thing. And so, you know, it's like, I do think that these are interesting data, but they have to be contextualized properly, you know, that this isn't, you know, this is like a snapshot of some of these stands. And, and this question gets out, you know, one of the limits, like what are, what were the, the, what was the variation among the sites? And then, you know, what, what was the, the recent history too, you know, how much um, thinning occurred, what were the treatments and things like that. But so, so we definitely had an array of sites. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, that my, my gut is that those drier sites um, were, were hit harder with mortality, you know, or suffered more mortality than, than some of the um, richer, uh, um, you know, wetter sites. Okay. Um, and then I, here's a question on spraying. You said that you don't do that much work with spraying. So do you, I mean, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, if, if somebody has questions about, you know, the works. chemicals and spray treatment, anything like that, they really have to reach out to their um, state folks and, and they'd be able to navigate all that for them. Okay, so Jeremy, you can get a hold of the New York State DEC. So, but there are, I mean, from what I've, I've never been involved with spraying for gypsy moth. We did spray once here at the Arnott Forest for forest tent caterpillar. And there are yeah. private firms that do that. Uh, they're aerial spraying, they're licensed and certified, and they fill up really quickly. And when there's a, when there's a, a lot of defoliation, then everybody wants them spraying their land. And at least with forest tent, the window of opportunity is pretty narrow, so you'd want to get a hold of them as soon as possible to get on their on their work list. Yeah, and that, and that's the same with Lamantria and Spar, right? You have a, a especially if you're using BT, you know, you have a narrow window um, that you want to get it out on. And I know in New York that you know New York doesn't provide funding, at least I believe they do not provide funding um, for you know like landowner assistance for spraying for Lamantria and Spar. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not aware of, uh, it, at least maybe there's something more recently, but I've been historically, I'm not aware of financial support. How long after, how long can you salvage oak trees after two to three years of defoliation? So if you're getting into that, you know, second year, third year of defoliation, you're like, all right, these trees are looking pretty ragged. Yeah. How, I mean, how quickly do you need to take action? Do you think what's, what's the rate of I mean, when you were out there, were you worried about the kind of falling limbs and yeah. uh, personal hazards or what's yeah. the? Yeah, it's a good question. And one that kind of surprised me, you know, I thought, so my background, mostly like in assessing mortality in pines. Um, and, you know, so I have a better feel for that. And I just kind of thought like, oh, these oaks, you know, we'll be able to core them you know, for three or four years after, you know, after death. But uh, I think the way that they died, which was slow, um, so you had a lot of different levels of decay on the tree. Um, so we were worried about branches falling um, in some sites, especially in exposed sites. Um, but I really, you know, so we were in sites that had died, you know, within two years, let's say, maybe three years in some cases with some of the trees. And, you know, the outer, bark was sloughing off, the outer rings were, you know, the wood was already getting a little bit um, mushy. The mushy is too strong of a word, but there was decay occurring. So I think, and you know, this is outside of my expertise in terms of, you know, what, what use you can get out of trees, you know, over time um, since death, but years or three years, um, you're losing, uh, some of those out that outer area of the tree but there's probably still you know good wood in there but um yeah I, I don't I wouldn't go too much further in because you're getting a lot of fungi in there you've got other other borers that are you know attacking those trees to or colonizing those trees and mining through the sapwood 
Uh, so I had originally thought going in there that, you know, we had a lot of time to, to, <laughs> to think about coring and stuff like that, but that, that was not the truth. And, and a lot of that was just that the, di- the trees didn't, some of the trees just die, you know, within one year, but the other ones, there's, there was a gradual decline, but um, there's probably good information out there on that, you know, Connecticut salvage logs, um, some of this, but again, you know, they were getting in quick. I think they were probably in, um, the year, there may, there may be some folks on here that, that know this, but I think they were getting into these stands the year after um, heavy, you know, when mortality started to happen. And then, you know, there's that game, too, it's not a game, but like, you know, do you salvage trees that are still living? You know, do you want to cut those so you get stump sprouts coming in, um, you know, because you don't get stump, not stump sprouts from dead oak. So in some cases, you might enter a little bit earlier than than in others, I guess I'm getting out with that. Mm-hmm. So, and I guess it also, and you mentioned this, Kevin, it, it depends a little bit on what you're going to be using it for. So yeah. you found clearly for increment boring and research purposes, you know, the, the rate of, of decay is pretty fast and it is of limited, you have a short window for somebody that, for a landowner that wants to cut firewood, yeah. um, you know, they've got, you know, many years in, in all cases though, people need to remember that when you're felling dead trees that the wood fibers don't behave the same way as a live tree do and they become much more dangerous um, to fell even if they're freshly dead or fairly freshly dead. Okay, in an area with high levels of Lymantria, how effective is egg mass removal for individual trees and will caterpillars travel from adjacent properties? Yeah, I, I mean, that's the difficult thing, you know, you, and, and that's what's kind of getting at, you know, being aware of your local conditions. And it's easy that, you know, if you have, you know, a, a number of trees that, that, that you believe, you know, scraping egg masses will help protect, uh, you can do that work and then larvae are going to balloon in from um, adjacent landowners. So it's best to maybe, you know, if you can work with uh, neighbors and things like that. If you're in an urban area, if you're in a forest, I mean, you know, I, I don't really know. You know, my sense is it'll cut down on defoliation, but it's not going to eliminate it. And then, you know, because these things on trees where larvae are, they're just going to balloon off um, and end up on the crowns of your trees, but there'll be less of them there. But in high populations, less doesn't necessarily mean much <laughs> in terms of impacts on trees. If you've got, you know, millions and you, know, you end up less than 900,000, you're still going to see um, significant defoliation. So it's a, it really is a tough call. And I, I don't really have a good answer for you in, in terms of when you, you know, by doing that, how much you protect your, your tree. The, I know the way that you can protect your tree if you're really concerned about it is timing uh, um, insecticide treatments. And I'm not a person who, you know, readily promote spraying, but, you know, BT is a, a relatively um, less uh, damaging uh, pesticide to, you know, native, native species and other um, insects than some of the, um, some of the more, you know, <laughs> impactful chemicals that are out there. Sure. Um, so, Somebody wants to just clarify. So if you're like removing the egg masses, all you do is just kind of scrape them off and let them drop on the ground. You don't need to do anything else. Uh, you can, you know, you can burn them. You can throw them in um, soapy water or something like that. But yeah, don't just toss them on the ground. Um, you can still get emergence from that. Oh. You should try to destroy them some way. You can get creative. That's, that's that's too bad. I would just like when I see them out in the woods, I just take my thumb and rub them off, and I figure, you know, yeah. some some little uh, rodent is going to eat them. But maybe maybe I've yeah. just been I've just now I put them on my boots and I spread them around. So there you go. <laughs> well, I think I think the Pete Smallage method might work if you squish them on the tree with your thumb, then stomp on them and drag them around. Probably not much <laughs> is going to come out of that. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so people can read the comments or some uh, input on the Jeremy's question about aerial spraying um, and just note, uh, send your questions to everyone, not just to the hosts and panelists, some resources. Um, 
All right, and then some input on salvage logging. So great. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you very much. This was uh, very interesting. I appreciate, appreciate the work that you did and appreciate that you shared that with us. So, um, and I want to thank all of the participants. We had 172 at the peak. So, yep, Jared says bring, bring one of those little uh, uh, propane torches with you when you're out walking in the woods. <laughs> so. That but but so it's like yeah but then there's like okay so you don't want to cook the tree though either <laughs> all right kevin yeah. thank you i'll see you back tonight at seven and yep. to the audience thank you all hope you have a great day and enjoy your afternoon thanks everybody take care thanks kevin